You're watching The Issue Is. Frankly, this was, I believe, the greatest political movement of all time. Trump dominates and Kamala Harris loses ground. And the country will be feeling the impact of this week for decades to come. Welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. We got a lot to unpack, so we brought in some of the big guns this week. On our panel for the first time is Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter, who represents Orange County in the House for the next few months. She ran for Senate earlier this year, and she has gone viral for years explaining complicated concepts with her famous whiteboard. I don't think she brought the whiteboard today, but we still will get into the complicated concepts. Uh, also with us this week is Peter Hamby, uh, who is the host of Puck's uh, Powers That Be podcast, and he also is the host of Good Luck America on Snapchat, where he recently traveled the country talking to young voters. Uh, great to have both of you here. Thanks for being here. Congresswoman, let's start with you. What happened? Why did Trump win? Well, I, I think there's probably a lot of things going on. I would remind people at the start of this that while Trump won the presidency, Democrats actually fared pretty well in a lot of ways this election cycle. We won in a lot of states that Trump won, right? North Carolina, Wisconsin, where we got majorities in the legislature. Um, and the House, I think, is still potentially on a path to Democratic control. So I, I don't think this is a mandate. I think that Democrats need to continue to fight for the American people, to fight for the issues that matter most to people. And I think in this next immediate aftermath, we need to avoid the blame and instead talk about and be responsive to our constituents. So on election night, I was with, I went to pick up my daughter from water polo practice and she's 12 and she got in the car and she was crying. And I said, did someone punch you? Like water polo is a rough sport. Yeah. I was like, did someone hit you? Did the coach yell at you? What happened? And she said, mom, Trump won, Trump's gonna win. And what if I get raped and I need to have an abortion? This is from a 12-year-old, my 12-year-old daughter. Mm. And so it was really a reminder of how scary this time is for people um, and how important it is for Democrats to have strategies, both at the state level and the federal level, to make sure that we can continue to protect people's rights. But let me push back a second on the concept that this wasn't sort of a, a mandate. I mean, he won every single swing state uh, and he gained in almost every single county in the country, gaining in California. Well, I think Orange County. Yeah. I mean, I think gaining is really different than saying like everybody agrees, which oh. is how I think about a mandate. Okay. So let's I mean, it's not 1980. It's not it's, 1984. That's right. Right. So look, I think it's important for us to think about what were the issues and what were the voters that moved toward him. Clearly, Americans feel anxious about economic opportunity. They feel anxious about where our economy is in the world. Younger voters in particular, I think, worry about are they going to be able to afford housing? Are they going to be able to afford to start an economy? What will AI mean for those jobs? And I do think Vice President Harris had a good message message on those things. But Trump ran a very chaotic, noisy campaign. And I think to the extent it was just hard for that message to penetrate. And, and Peter, you spent a lot of time talking to young voters all around the country. And last week on our show, you talked about what they said to you. Here's some of that. Even the Kamala Harris voters open to the idea of Donald Trump a little bit because it might make their pocketbooks mm. a little healthier. How do you read what happened? I mean, Congresswoman Porter is right on the young people talking about the economic anxieties they have. In, in college students I was talking to, only, only a third of Americans have a college degree. They're not emblematic of all young people. Graduating into a you know world or just their community where rent is higher. I heard the grocery thing, the gas thing, the prices thing over and over again, as I said there, even from young women of color who were going to vote for Kamala Harris, but they were worried about it. And so you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but looking back on those interviews, there were all some clues in there. I think big picture, I think Kamala Harris probably ran the best campaign she could under incredibly r rare, unprecedented circumstances. The drag of Joe Biden being very unpopular was clear. Also, you know, smarter people than I have stepped back. Pretty much every incumbent government in the entire world mm -hmm. has been uh, wiped out in the post covid world prices everywhere they could be a it could be a very right leaning government in india it could be uh, our uh, it could be biden's administration here and kamala harris like everyone just is feeling the blowback of prices that downward pressure really made people anxious and i also think you know one thing i learned out on the road too is the abortion issue is a little more complicated than people think like once you get into the second trimester there's some mixed feelings about it in polling some people i talked to young kamala harris voters even you know were 
I don't I wouldn't say they were uh, sympathetic to Donald Trump, but the idea that abortion could be back in the states, maybe Donald Trump moderated on that a little bit. But uh, look, that doesn't mean there aren't real world consequences um, to the abortion restrictions that are pretty drastic in many, many states. But the economy was the prevailing issue overall, and that's what won it for. And the truth on the inflation issue is that America has actually done better than most of the rest of the world. Uh, but that is a tough message for people higher to understand. To I mean, you're, you're, still, not, you're, yeah. not, you're not comparing your prices to what somebody's paying in the UK. Right, right. You're comparing your prices to what you and paid also, a year ago. You're also not looking at like, uh, you know, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics when you... <laughs> Go to the gas station. No, or the you're, you're store. standing in front of the two exactly. boxes of cereal and you're yeah. saying, I am not, like I've yeah. told my son, Paul, we are not buying $7 Apple Jacks. Like they're just not that good. Like we're <laughs> not putting those in the cart. Like go find some generic cereal, the generic Cheerios, and put them in. And so I, I think people experience that mm -hmm. in a very personal way. And I think for Democrats, it's not that they, they have strong economic policy. I have grave concerns about, as does every economist in the world, about what Donald Trump's proposed policies will mean for our economy. But I think Democrats' struggle is how do you connect those policies to those very concrete moments yeah. in people's lives, and, like standing at the grocery and store. And there's a strong argument that tariffs is going to make everything more expensive, but the Democrats were not able to effectively communicate that Joe, message. <laughs> Joe Biden has never been the world's greatest communicator, but he hasn't communicated what he did for the economy. Bernie Sanders put out a statement the other day saying the Democratic Party forgot about the middle class. Let's, put, let's put that up on the screen right now. Uh, this is what Bernie Sanders had to say, and it's quite something, um, basically uh, saying here, uh, it should come as no great surprise that a Democratic Party, which has abandoned working class people, would find that the working class has abandoned them. So look, Joe Biden was the first president to walk a picket line. When I was traveling through mm -hmm. Michigan and Pennsylvania a couple weeks ago, like you would see signs from you know the infrastructure act like this highway brought to you by he did the donald trump thing joe biden he signed his name on these uh, uh billboards that were all over the place but people didn't understand that there's also the question of culture you know if when bernie sanders is talking about the working class like democratic uh the democratic party used to be the party of workers uh, and the republican party was the party of management Country and like club. it's kind of been flipped on its head a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Trump has astutely used culture as a way in with white working class voters, but also non-white working class voters. And we obviously saw that in exit polls, which are flawed and will be revised right. and we'll see. But it's very clear that within that, at least like Latinos decisively moved in Trump's direction. Do you think Senator Sanders is right? Well, look, I think Democrats... Um, have better policies for working class people. And we've seen that. We've seen that in what Trump did with his tax bill last time he was president, mm -hmm. which was huge giveaways to the ultra wealthy and really punished middle class and working class voters with his tax policy. The idea that Donald Trump is some kind of like look like um, actually has experience with what it's like to be a working American is laughable. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that Democrats don't have work to do in how they communicate policy. And one of the things I've talked a lot about, Alex, is, you know, being a mom of young kids in Congress, um, what it's like to live on your congressional mm -hmm. salary. What can we do to make it easier to elect young people, working class people? And you saw my colleague, Marie Glusenkamp Perez, mm -hmm. who won a very tough race in Washington. Um, I've won again and again in Orange County where Donald Trump is currently leading. Um, and it's because I think there is a hunger for us to have a government that is representative. And so I think Democrats do need to think about what are we doing with our policies, the establishment or the status quo that is holding back candidates who have that ability to connect. And I think that's a legitimate thing for us to be asking ourselves. It, it is amazing if you think about it. Donald Trump, who lives in literally a golden tower in a country club and flies around on a private jet, has this ability to connect with working class people and make them feel heard by him. It's, it's a real conundrum because it's, if you look at the battleground states, and there were real campaign effects uh, in the swing states, Kamala Harris did like 2.4 points better or something than in the non-swing states. So the campaign did have a positive effect mm -hmm. for her. She got more raw votes in those battleground states, most of them except for Pennsylvania, than Joe Biden did. Mm -hmm. But Donald Trump got even more than that. And so uh, I'm curious to hear from you on this, actually, because in 2017, like you were elected in 2018, we had the resistance. There was this like uprising and this anger in, in the middle and on the left against Donald Trump. This time, how do Democrats respond to possibly a popular vote victory, the fact that Donald Trump got more votes than Kamala Harris, who got more votes than Joe Biden, 
it, it's just a very fascinating entanglement. It's culture, it's economics, and it's how Democrats communicate what they do. I mean, Marie Glusenkamp Perez is a good example. She did an interview in the New York Times on Friday where she talked a lot about just casework. Like, I do mm -hmm. constituent services. Yeah. Like, someone has a tax issue, I'm going in on that. Right. And, like, that's hard to extrapolate at the national level where cultural issues are very important. Blueprint, the last thing I'll say, which is a Democratic polling firm, they put out a lot of messaging advice this cycle. They came out with a poll Friday that said the number one reason swing voters think Kamala Harris lost is because she was perceived as too liberal on cultural issues and social issues. Um, some of the things that she took positions on back in 2019 that she wasn't able to get away from. I, I think Peter brings up an interesting question for you. Th this idea of where does the quote unquote resistance go from here? Because we saw the big protests and the pussy hats and everything in the streets. And, and we haven't seen that this week. Uh, it seems like there was more of a shrug almost. Uh, where, what is the effective way for Democrats to resist Donald Trump uh, and win elections going forward? Well, I think there's a lot of work that will be done at the local and state level. And we've seen some of that already. We saw Governor Newsom saying he's going to have a special session. We know that Attorney General Bonta um, has and will continue to try to defend people's rights. I think the fact that we saw people elect Democrats governors in places like North Carolina, um, majority legislatures in places like Wisconsin, mm. it means that people think Democrats actually, in the policies that are closest to their lives, actually do a really, really good job. Whether they're trusting us or connecting with us on these high, sort of distant cultural issues, I think is a different question. I will say, and you remember this from my Senate campaign, I very, very much ran on an economic message about corruption, about lobbying, about special Special interests, and I think in for sort of the resistance, for lack of a better term, they really feed off hearing about um, hearing about democracy and the Constitution and mm -hmm. that kind of that kind of stuff. For most swing voters, that's not where it's at. Yep. And if you're going to talk about, I do think Donald Trump's an existential threat to our democracy, and the fact that that's true, and they got so much feedback from within democratic circles about it meant that we weren't always consistently for the last two years. I think mm -hmm. Kamala Harris actually did an excellent job of, of not doing this, but I think kind of across the democratic ecosystem. So I think for people, it's gonna be about really looking at who are my neighbors? Who mm. lives in America? What are the challenges? And Democrats need to understand what it is like to not own a house today and face the prospects of never being right. able to own one. The postmortems of this campaign will be, there will be many, but one question that will be debated going forward is Kamala Harris closing on democracy, sort of issues that might sound Fascism. academic to mm -hmm. certain voters and getting away from economic and, issues and, and middle class populism. And I wonder how many people could even define the word fascism, if that's what you're, you're running on. At the, I, at didn't, the I didn't hear it come up, I will say, when I was talking to uh, students at commuter schools in Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Yeah. It, it, not that they don't know what fascism means, it's just that the first thing on the tip of their tongue was either the economy and then a bunch of other issues, but democracy and fascism rarely came up. Uh, one of the big questions going forward is, is there going to be a Democratic House or not? Uh, this week, I spoke with Pete Aguilar, who's the chair of the House Democrats. He's the congressman uh, from the Inland Empire. Here's some of what he said about what's ahead. It would be better if we were in the majority. Um, and so that's what we're working on right now. Based off of what you're seeing, and you know this stuff better than just about anyone, are, are you tracking right now like a one or two seat difference? What, are, what do you think it's going to ultimately come down to? Uh, you know, the, the, the weather forecast is tight. Um, that, that's what it is. Um, look, we're not in a position to, to say what, what the majority will be, um, but we are in a position to say uh, the majority is not certain. Congresswoman, I know there were a lot of people that were wishing that you were returning to Congress. Uh, your district itself, Dave Min, running to replace you. You feel good about that one? I do. I think Democrat Dave Min is going to win the race over um, Republican Scott Baugh, who I beat last time. And look, like, I know this better than anyone. I spent nine days in 2018 um, losing before I was winning um, mm -hmm. and then went on to serve in Congress. Even in last election cycle 2022, it took me six days to have the race called. This is part of how California voting works. Um, and so I I think we're going to see in the next day or two, tonight, tomorrow, um, and into next week, I think we will pick up a few more seats in California, and that will bring us very, very close to a Democratic majority. I don't know if we get there, as I agree with Congressman Aguilar, the weather forecast is tight. Yeah, uh, and, and a lot of people watching this are going to be like, 
Why does it take so much longer in California than, ask than I'm Florida? <laughs> Florida gets it. And, and really, it is a feature, not a bug. Can you explain yes. why California has made this decision to do it this way? Because it is a decision. Yep. It's not just California. It's actually most of the West Coast. So Washington, Oregon, Arizona, increasingly. We have decided that we want to give people the entirety of Election Day to cast their ballot and to be able to cast their ballot on Election Day in the way that works best for them, which means we can't count the ballots at 8 o'clock because they're still being poked into the drop box at 7.59. People are still postmarking them and they're on mail trucks and they're coming in. So look, the research is really clear. When you have this kind of system, you allow more people to participate in our democracy. You have a more representative democracy. It's procrastinators, I mean, we all know them. Oh, yeah. I'm not one, but there are a lot of them out there. <laughs> and we, they should have just as much a right to be heard in the election as others. So it does take a few more days, but it's a very, very good election system. And it allows people who maybe can't get time off work to drop it off at eight o'clock, who maybe can't stand in line for three and four hours, like we saw mm -hmm. in my congressional district this cycle. The lines at University of California, Irvine, were, were four and five hours long at times. So it does permit people to be able to vote in the way that's best for them. So we're allowing for people to mail in ballots, which have to come in. We're doing signature verification on all the mail in ballots, mm -hmm. which takes time. If there's an error on the signature verification, we give people People time to fix it yep. so that they make sure that their ballot is counted, which is why it takes a lot longer. And we have seen voter participation go way up uh, because of this. Uh, in 2020, we were at over 70 percent voter registration yeah. or voter participation, which was the highest that we saw uh, since 1952. I really like this proud Californian vibe coming from you because I, <laughs> I really do think that that we ought to be asking ourselves in some of these states where it's gotten more difficult to vote over the last four years. Yeah. What is the cost of that? So we are seeing an electorate in some of these states where, yes, it swung for Donald Trump, and I think there's something real there, but we also had a lot of states where it became more difficult to vote and people were purged from the rolls and the, and the system of voting is My home state of Virginia. Yeah. yeah, I am a proud Californian. Me Always. too. Yeah, Always. we know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Governor Gavin Newsom in Ventura County this week, meeting with uh, rescue crews at the Mountain Fire on the same day that he called for a special session to preemptively set aside money to fight the Trump administration. I talked with Jesse Gabriel, the chair of the budget committee about that. Hopefully we will not be in a position where we don't have to file a lot of these lawsuits. This is the, this is to be ready in the case that they break the law, that they violate the U.S. Constitution, that they are doing things that are unlawful or unconstitutional, and we're not going to get caught flat footed. Let's talk more with our panel right now, Katie Porter and Peter Hamby. Peter, uh, there are some people that see what the governor is doing as just a step uh, to running for president and that it's a stunt and that it's unnecessary. What say you? I was going to say that a lot of people are going to perceive it as a stunt that he's posturing for the next presidential election, that Kamala Harris losing opens the door to Gavin Newsom. Um, the flip side of that is Gavin Newsom is actually a very bright, intelligent person who reads all the language and the laws. And two, it, it, let's acknowledge we do live in a country where we have red states and blue states. And leadership in California very much has the right to huddle after what is likely to be a very uh, ahistorical, unprecedented second Trump term and figure out what can we do for our people here in California. Remember, after Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accords, Mayor Garcetti here, like a bunch of Democratic governors, they got together on their own. And they're like, how can we keep fighting this even if there's no larger framework? So I think Governor Newsom's absolutely making the right move for his party and, you know, his state. I know you've publicly agreed with that. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think, look, there are a lot of people who Trump made clear are going to be kind of in his line of sight. Um, both people who maybe are, you know, are DACA students, um, you know, people who are worried about abortion, people who are trans. Like, there are a lot of people who are having a lot of anxiety. It's not just... I disagree. It's actually mm -hmm. we had a presidential candidate who said, I'm going to come and I'm going to go get them. I'm going to go harm them. I'm going to go take away things from them. And so I think it's absolutely appropriate. Look, we have a federalist system. We are the, as Gavin said in his tweet, we ha I should call him Governor Newsom, but as Governor Newsom said in his tweet, we are the United States of America. And it's, I agree with Peter. It's appropriate for states to take action. And also action. every, by the way, like, like it or not, how many Republican attorneys general filed 
lawsuits against the Biden administration the whole time. Like if a Republican governor did the same thing, you know, it, like they would also say this is like states' rights. You know, that's it's part of the checks and it's part of the checks and balances. So when we talk, there's been so much talk about what can we do at the federal level to potentially check Donald Trump, and I, you know, I think winning the House is is one of the things, um, and I was certainly part of that check in 2018, but the other is to recognize that our states and even our localities do have the ability to, to curb some of that excess or to prevent some of that harm. We just got some of the law professor, Katie Porter, there uh, for, for a second. So let, let's look into the future now. Kamala Harris was the first Democratic presidential nominee ever from California, somebody that you know well, used to work for. What do you think's next for her? Do you think she's going to run for governor? Well, I hope some rest is next for her. Um, I, I have a little little bit of a taste of how tiring a campaign is. Um, but look, this is somebody who truly um, has spent her entire career in government service, in public service, um, and has continued to seek out new opportunities pretty aggressively. So I can't say exactly what that's going to look like for her, but I would be surprised if this is the last we've seen of her willingness to serve the American people and Californians in particular. What about governor? Um, I don't know what she's thinking. Yeah. I don't know what all, I mean, we have a big race is coming up in 2026. And I, yeah. I do think it's not just our governor's race, but we have all, you know, all of the constitutional officers really coming up in 2026. She's so, she's so young and she's so talented. Like she doesn't have to run for governor now. She can pull a Jerry Brown and run in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, he was governor 36 and at 80. Um, <laughs> but there, are, of course, are a lot of people that are wondering if you are going to run for governor. So what are you thinking? I am still thinking, um, I think is the answer. So I, look, I don't, I feel a little bit like I, I think Kamala does, like I care about these issues and particularly these economic issues. The cost of housing was the sort of marquee thing in my Senate campaign, the thing I talked the most about. I'm so glad to see Democrats finally beginning to engage on what has been a big problem. Um, and so I don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. I'm going back to law teaching in the spring. Um, I have, I'm you know looking forward to whiteboarding some law students in the meantime, and then we'll see <laughs> Where it goes from there. But look, California has challenges. We also have so many opportunities. And I think, particularly with Donald Trump as president, having that strong state leadership, someone really tough who's willing to stand up to Donald Trump, as Gavin has been, is going to be important. So do you have a timeline on when you might make that decision? I do not. Okay. And Peter, are you running for governor? I just know I do not want to take your law school class. That would scare the F out of me. <laughs> no, no, I, it's, it's my bark is worse than my bite. Uh, okay. Uh, well, it is great to see you both. Thank you for your insight.